If you enjoy watching Common Ground online, please consider making a tax-deductible donation at lptv.org. Lakeland Public Television presents Common Ground, brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Welcome to Common Ground. I'm your host, Scott Knudsen. In this season seven finale, watch as Michael Lyons of Bemidji illustrates cartoons in the Ojibwe language. Then enter the Wadena studio of Brad Wegscheid as he creates the public art for Lakeland Public Television's new building. My earliest Ojibwe, I learned from my grandpa, Aubrey Lyons, who was a Leech Lake Ojibwe. And so I think probably the first word I learned from him was Makare Mashkiki Wabu, which means black medicine water or coffee. So growing up, I would hear little phrases and stuff. I could hear my grandmother saying, uh, Ambe, we send in da, you know, come on, let's eat, or, uh, you know, stuff like that. So then the next step would be to add the ink to it. And so I'll add the ink. This step is right before I scan it and then add computer color. So that might be interesting. So like I always draw in pencil first, but also I do a lot of tracing. Like if I have more than one character and I want to make sure their heads are going to be the same size or deliberately one in the foreground, one in the background. And then the inking too, um, I do my, my strips really big and then they shrink down to the size that you can see on a phone. So I've got to add a lot of weight to the ink line so that it's visible when it's reduced down to a really small size. And it's like most people get their news on their phones or their computer. And so you have to adjust to it. Like this part is, is really fun for me, but you know, would take, it just takes a long time. Part of what I think is cool about cartoons is that there's an illusion that you did it really fast. The style of cartoons gives the impression that the guy, you know, just whipped it out. And the truth is it takes just as long for, at least in my style of cartooning, as if I were doing a painting. I've always approached cartoons in the same way that any traditional artist would approach their work, even though it looks like it, it's not hard to do. When I was a kid and I first started thinking of myself as a cartoonist, and I, and I was a kid, this was a childhood dream of mine. I actually said I, w I wanted to be a cartoonist because I thought saying you wanted to be an artist was pretentious. And then, as I kept doing cartoons, when I went to college, I started doing cartoons and I would call myself a cartoonist, but I started getting self-conscious because I thought it was, you know, childish. Then I have come full circle where now I want to talk about it more because when I go to high schools and elementary schools and stuff like that, I'm really there kind of, you know, to inspire kids to not be self-conscious, to, to dream and to follow what they want to do in life. Uh, so now I'm old enough where I'm going back to, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm like a traditional artist. My medium is cartoons. And to me, cartoons have always been in the same way any, any artist follows a trajectory where in their life, they're in certain periods. You know, like Picasso had a blue period. I had a comic strip period. And then I went into coloring book period. And for the last few years, I've been in this sort of Ojibwe language children's book period. And then just recently, 
the gibberish became my latest phase, I guess. The name came to me because I started studying Ojibwe in 1995 with my brother and a friend of mine, Mike Dahl. And uh, I stopped studying Ojibwe shortly after that. But um, at the time, I remember, I remember my brother saying, uh, well, it's time to go to an Ojibberish class or something like that, just because we were terrible at Ojibwe. So it's just kind of a funny thing that people say when they're learning Ojibwe. In 2009, I got hired on at Walker, Akeley, Hackensack schools as the Indian Education Director. And as part of my job, I taught a class called Anishinaabe Studies. And in the class, I would teach Ojibwe. And I can only teach them as much as I know, but I know just barely enough to teach beginning Ojibwe to kids who are patient with me. I learned most of the Ojibwe I know, and I'm not fluent, but about 12 years ago, I think, I was working at Leech Lake Tribal College, and I shared an office with an 83-year-old man who was a, and a, a Ojibwe was his first language. His name was Benny Tonts. And for about three years, we shared an office, and that was when Ojibwe became just something where every day at work you'd hear phrases thrown around. And that's when I did my first Ojibwe children's book, actually. Benny helped me actually write it, and it was called Dog and Maingan. And basically it was counting to ten in Ojibwe and naming Minnesota animals. And, I don't know, that just led to... Uh, Dog and Maingan eventually led to Buju Ojitimu, which was all Ojibwe, had no English in it. You know, so a lot of these themes started, kind of grew out of just regular day experiences uh, and stuff I was thinking about at the time. Oh, you know what? I can do some um, uh, ruler work, because that's really exciting. <laughs> I feel like I should be clear that I'm not a fluent speaker. I'm learning and I know enough phrases to uh, you know, impress people who don't understand Ojibwe. But, uh, so what I use a lot is um, a concise dictionary of Minnesota Ojibwe. And this is um, really a, a great dictionary that I use, um, especially for things like spelling, and really up to some of the words I just don't know. I did cartoons for years, and when I started incorporating Ojibwe language, people started becoming more interested. In fact, just when the gibberish started, it's only been running for three weeks, I think. A uh, paper in Duluth contacted me, and now it's going to be running in a, an alternative paper out there called Zenith. And I'm just seeing a lot of interest online coming my way. So in the old days, before I started using computers, I would do the entire cartoon by hand. And I still like using Prismacolor markers. There is a texture that you can't reproduce on Photoshop. And people will tell you that you can. You can make it more glossy and more impressive on Photoshop, but I've always wanted it to still look like somebody did it. I wanted kids to know that this was done with a marker and a pen. And one of the lines, so you never forget, that was done on paper. But nowadays, when I get to this stage of the cartoon, I've put just enough color in so I can dab that color and add it digitally. And so what I'll do at this point is turn on my scanner and scan it. So most mornings I wake up and I come and I sit down here and I pull up yesterday's gibberish. And so the first thing I have to do is get rid of the uh, cartoon from yesterday. So I'll click and delete that. So then, you know, I can just keep adding color much faster than I ever could before. Okay, so then I would grab the new completed cartoon and uh, you'll see I had to crop it down so it fit in the dimensions. Now when this in real size, on an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper, this is how big I do the strip in it. 
I like to do it big and then shrink it down so it'll fit in the size of how you view it on a telephone. And now I need to do the new words. Now there's a little skunk in this cartoon, and Jagag is Ojibwe for skunk. Z H I G A A G. I didn't know this word before I did it, but this drawing he's portraying that he's depressed. So then in Ojibwe, I'm depressed would be nin manendam. So I add the new Ojibwe word for the day. And we can feel sorry for this little skunk. And we're an Ojibwe word and an Ojibwe phrase. Oops. Now I need to convert this into a JPEG so it can be posted on Facebook. So then there's my Facebook, and this is what a gibberish looks like. And so I had to be considerate of how small the, the strip actually gets when it's on a phone. So that my fonts and my writing need to be really big so you can still read it at this size. Well, gibberish appears just on my Facebook and Twitter. But this year I got a grant from the Region 2 Arts Council. And so in the fall, a gibberish, beginning Ojibwe language instruction, the book will be coming out. And it's going to be an 8.5 by 11, 64 page color book that you could use for any like elementary Ojibwe language class. And so you'll see a lot of the same characters and then uh, it'll also have a little more in-depth Ojibwe language instruction. Part of this grant that I was awarded was not just to publish the book but to also go into classrooms and present all over the area. So in this fall I'll be uh, doing uh, 20 different classroom visits. And that's really the most fun that these cartoons bring out for me because I get to go in. The kids are really impressed. If you go into a fourth grade class and you can draw, it's like having a superpower. So I'm looking forward to going into those classes to promote, in a way to promote learning Ojibwe, but I'm also promoting uh, cartooning and art and doing projects on your own or growing as an artist. You know, a lot of what I talk about isn't just, you know, we need to learn Ojibwe. It's believe in yourself and do things that you think are interesting. And if you can do something interesting with your talents that help people, then people uh, respond. It's really cool when I go into these classes, especially when I was like Walker, where it'd be a mixed class. And on that day, you could see that the native kids would kind of sit up a little straighter, like, okay, here's one of ours, you know, and I, you know, they would all know me a little better. and. Uh, so sometimes I like going to those classes just to be a represent, representative of the community or a good role model.
Mm-hmm, you can, just a second. Something squeaking, I don't know. Okay, Maybe I'm... this is our Oreo. Okay, now we gotta go back. Okay, good job. Alright, now I'll flip these open, leave the stuff on top, and then all over to the table. What else Take all that hard work I did and rough it up. That's it for that part. to carve with too. What you making?
That's it for that. This one was at home and I should have done it. Uh, I've got to figure out where I'm going to center this. I'm going to set it between the wall and the wall or the wall and the beam. You've got to decide which is visually more balanced as opposed to measurement correct. That's what I've got to decide here. A sketch in the mirror with a plate of spacing. Thanks so much for watching. Join us again next season on Common Ground. If you have an idea for a Common Ground piece that pertains to North Central Minnesota, email us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3014. To view any episode of Common Ground online, visit us at lptv.org. episodes or segments of Common Ground, call 218-333-3020.
Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People, November 4th, 2008. If you enjoyed this episode of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.